live from Washington, D.C. There's my friend Laura there right now. Laura, we are handing it off to you. Thanks, Judge. You killed it tonight, as always. Thank Great you. show. Love doing it. Take care. It. And welcome, everybody, to the Ingram Angle from Washington. It isn't just a Merry Christmas. It's a truly historic one. Epic tax cuts cleared both houses of Congress and were sent to the president's desk today. I sat down with Vice President Mike Pence earlier this evening to get the White House take on this major achievement. That's coming right up. This massive overhaul of the tax code is the biggest in 30 years. It's going to benefit 80 percent of the American taxpayers and is a major victory for businesses and for workers. In fact, a slate of major corporations announced today that they'll be giving out special bonuses to hundreds of thousands of employees as a result of the new tax deal. Why, it's like Christmas Day at George Bailey's house. Kind of, except for the caroling. The tax bill also delivers another huge achievement to the president, a repeal of Obamacare's individual mandate. He did what Congress wouldn't do, which may be the death knell for a program that has been a drag on the U.S. economy. The president promises, by the way, that this is just the beginning. In a tweet congratulating Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Trump proclaimed, our team will go on to many more victories. Of course, the Democrats, with the help of some in the media, used a constant drumbeat of dire sky is falling predictions to drive down the popularity of the tax bill. But as South Carolina Senator Tim Scott said today, this victory is for all Americans. This is not about Washington. It's not about the left. It's not about the right. It's about single parent moms who are looking for a reason to be hopeful in 2018. For the average family who's working paycheck to paycheck, looking for ways to be hopeful about their future. Now, being there today at this event, I can tell you that it was pretty awesome because you could feel the buzz, the excitement that was in the air. And it was, uh, it was good for Republicans. They haven't had a lot to celebrate, really, as a, as a team, legislatively. But uh, without a doubt, it was palpable. And earlier this evening, I sat down for an exclusive with Vice President Mike Pence, and we discussed a variety of topics. But number one, the victory of this tax reform and a whole lot more coming up. Mr. Vice President, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Laura. It's a great day for America. Uh, so it's a historic day, first time in 30 yes. years. Last time was during the Reagan administration. Uh, tell me the mood in the West Wing today after a long battle. I think, uh, I think all of us just felt very grateful, uh, grateful for the president's strong leadership. Here's someone who literally ran on a commitment to revive the American economy, to make sure that the forgotten men and women of, of this country were forgotten no more. And I, I watched this president all year long as he fought, and not only for the largest tax cut in American history, which passed today, but, but for the kind of, you know, regulatory reform, rolling back federal red tape, the kind of releasing of American energy, all the things that have already revived the American economy. But, but to be here for, for the largest tax cut in the history of the country, the kind of tax reform we haven't seen for 31 years, and at the same time to repeal the individual mandate in Obamacare and open up ANWR uh, to environmentally responsible drilling is uh, just, uh, uh, it, it's just humbling for me to be a part of it. Uh, Republicans are always known to be deficit hawks, but this uh, legislation, by most estimates, does increase uh, the budget uh, deficit by about $1.5 trillion. What about that over 10 years? Uh, how, how concerned are you about that? And does that mean we're going to be tackling entitlements, as Paul Ryan always is wanting to do? Well, I can tell you, I mean, the, the need for the Congress to always look for ways to tighten its belt is a real priority for President Trump. But um, uh, the, the estimates of deficits here are all, all based on some pretty predictable uh, uh, you know, growth estimates going forward. Tax but, Policy um, yeah. uh, Foundation says it does take into account growth. Yeah. Even if the tax cuts are permanent, they say it adds about 1.4, 1.5. That's, that's right, but, but, but I got to tell you, President Trump really believes, we all do, 
that, that by letting the American people keep more of what they earn, by letting middle-income Americans have more spending power, by, by lowering taxes on businesses large and small, that, that, that we're going to outperform those growth, uh, those growth projections. And, and we're going to see those deficits uh, overcome by growth, but also by exercising the kind of fiscal responsibility that President Trump has been driving for since the first day of this administration. Why is the public not with this bill, though? Uh, polling, which, you know, I, I'm doubtful of some of the polling, but pretty much every poll puts it between about 33 percent and 42 percent a popularity of this legislation. How do you guys go out now to every part of the country and sell this as a tax cut for the middle class, even though the top 20 percent do get the lion's share of the relief? Well, as the president did today on the South Lawn, we're going to continue to make the case for this middle class miracle. I mean, when the president laid out a, a vision for historic tax relief this year, he basically said, we want to cut taxes for every American. Do you have well, some work to do here to sell this? I, I think maybe a little bit. I got to tell you, when the American people start to see more in their paychecks in February, and they're going to start to realize that, uh, that the president's vision here that this middle class miracle that was passed today by the Congress was an idea whose time has come and I, I really do believe that it's going to sell itself. Carried interest uh, benefits hedge funds. They get to uh, have their profits taxed at a much lower rate than uh, most Americans. That survives in this legislation. That right. doesn't seem like you're kind of taking this new approach to, you know, to the big hedge fund uh, force in the United States. I understand the president wanted it out of the legislation which Republicans demanded that it stay in? Well, look, the, the president would have been happy to see it come out. But uh, the, did he go to the mat on that? Because the, why should hedge fund guys get this continued benefit of a low tax rate? How does that how does that look to the middle class? Well, I think what the president went to the mat on was really just advancing that vision that he articulated this spring for tax relief. This economy is already rolling at, at, at three percent growth, which people told the president during the campaign. They laughed they, at him. They laughed. They said yeah. it would take years to get to 3%. He got there by the, by the third quarter of this year, and, and, and we're continuing to see growth. But I, I truly do believe that you're going to see companies that had, had too many incentives in our old tax code to take jobs overseas, and you're going to start seeing jobs coming back to this country. You're going to see trillions of dollars pouring back into this country, investing in American jobs and American workers, and we're going to see our economy expand like never before. Are you surprised, Mr. Vice President, that you didn't get one Democratic vote? Not one. Yes. Yes, I am, actually. Uh, I, I find that to be actually stunning, even as partisan as things are. Yeah. Not a single, and was there anything that Republicans could have done? Joe Manchin said he, you know, it was all behind closed doors, which so, is not accurate, but he I said he had a list of things that were never considered. Yeah, Laura, the, look, I, uh, so the House and the Senate to the White House. So what didn't work? For meetings, for meals, to sit down, to say, we want to work with you. Well, when you have the, the majority of the members of the Senate, Democrats in the Senate, sign a letter last summer taking themselves completely out of the equation, that, that's a disappointment, not just to our administration, but to the American people. The American people want to see the Congress work together. And I, I promise you, you know this president well. He's going to continue to reach out across the aisle. We're going to take on issues like welfare reform and infrastructure next year to rebuild America. You want Paul Ryan to stay as House Speaker, and there was some scuttlebutt that he might be leaving sooner than uh, people thought. I think the result of this tax cut really speaks for itself. And the president and I hold Speaker Ryan in the highest regard and want him to stay in the Congress and continue to lead the Congress because we're really just getting started. Are you guys willing to do Medicare reform or is that just too big of a hill to climb once again? Well, first off, the president made it made it clear during the campaign we're not going to be cutting Social Security. No cuts, Medicare. no changes. How, how can that but be remember on that on that health care bill that we came close on a couple of times, was fundamental reform in Medicaid. I mean, there are ways that, that we can find savings and even improve services to our most vulnerable Americans in these programs. And I, I promise you, whether it's Medicaid or other areas, uh, the Medicare, Social Security, to we're not going to touch those in the I, first th term? The president's been very clear on those issues. But look, a growing economy and fiscal responsibility, giving states more flexibility to administer programs like Medicaid is a pathway toward fiscal solvency. Do you think we can grow our way out of $20 trillion in debt, though, Mr. Uh, Vice President? We, even with 4.9% growth, that's a, that's a steep cliff. We, we think we, we, uh, 
we have a president who has a boundless opinion about the capacity of the American people and the strength of the American economy. And, and I have no doubt that what we've seen in, in this year alone, where the economy is coming back, optimism is back. We, and all of that is before today, that, that as this tax cut takes effect and takes hold, as, as, as people begin to feel the freedom from that mandate in Obamacare that was repealed as well. Think about that. For the last seven years, the American people have had to pay a tax uh, it, it, for, the, for, the, for the privilege of not having to buy insurance that provided them with poor and minimal coverage. Democrats really thought they had derailed the Trump train in its tracks, but tonight the president seems to have all the momentum. To put it all perspective with us, we're joined by Fox News contributor and senior editor for The Federalist, Molly Hemingway, and Igor Volsky is the vice president of the Center for American Progress. Great to have you both on. Uh, Igor, let's start with you. You heard what the vice president said. He's very confident, optimistic. He said, we're just getting started. Well, I'll agree with you, Laura. I'll start like that. You said that most of the tax cuts go to the richest Americans, and that's precisely the problem with this bill. For a president who ran on a populist agenda, the forgotten man and woman, to give a tax cut, 83% of the benefits by 2023 go to the top 1%. That's a big problem. And the middle class, income, middle class tax cuts expire over time. I mean, you add to that the fact that 13 million people are going to lose their health insurance, that premiums are going to go up by $2,000. And this thing is a real disaster. This is the whole problem with democratic messaging, though. I mean, you're hearing everybody say, oh, these tax cuts don't help anybody but the wealthiest. My husband and I are middle class. We calculated what we're going to get, and we are so happy with what we're going to get. I mean, a lot of people say, oh, 1000 or $2,000 isn't very much. For people like me, it's a huge you're ordeal. You're in for a real surprise when those cuts expire, when your taxes are going to go up by 2025 if, because they change the way yeah. the inflation in is calculated. Years. That's a real problem, right? right? Guys, let's look at look, these are the companies that are offering bonuses, just, just enough. Yeah today. Yeah, yeah. Pay increase and more on the heels of this tax legislation. Boeing, AT&T, Fifth Third Bank Corp, Wells Fargo, Comcast, hundreds of thousands of employees are either getting increases in minimum wage, those are, you know, middle class people, or thousand dollar surprise bonuses because of this. The, the, I understand the Democrats' messaging. It's, this, they're going to say it doesn't, mean, it, doesn't bill, mean, you know, it, does, it doesn't mean anything. It means that Trump's not a populist. I, just, I, I reject that because we know the top income earners pay the lion's share of taxes. So obviously they're going to get more numer in numerically in tax cuts if you're going to do this kind of tax reform. But business is made up of individuals, isn't yeah. it? Not, is yep. it not? Aren't yep. individuals through 401ks, their pension funds, they need business to do well. I mean, if business is not doing well and optimistic, that does not in any way filter down to the workers who need raises or, or inc increases in income, well, correct? I mean, it's great that we're buying the corporate spin about what these companies are doing in bonuses. That's very different in terms of increasing wages. But you look at larger surveys of companies and you look at a Which Yale, a Yale survey, for instance, came out just a couple days ago, 110 CEOs. Only 14 percent, Laura and Molly, 14 percent said they would invest so, the benefits yeah, into ahead, into wages. Corporate tax rates are a tax on employees. I mean, there have been studies that show that high that when you tax a corporation, most of that is borne by employees. So should we repeal cutting, it? Cutting corporate tax rates is a benefit to employees. And we have been out of line in this country relative to Europe on our corporate tax rates. Companies have every incentive to take their business overseas when we are making it hostile for them to well, employ people we, here. Molly, and we, so part of, part of what you say is, oh, well, this is really corporate tax repeal and not much of, a, of an income uh, tax relief for, for people. But corporate tax relief does is, does is very important for actual employees. And you know where and it goes? It, to corporate CEOs, not to the men and no, women actually, who work again, for those corporate tax rates are borne by employees in suffering. Right. They, lo they lose wages, and, they, and, the, and that's a really big Well, if you want to make the case for repealing corporate taxes, we can have Okay, let's debate. talk about, um, we talked about Republican messaging, which I think has to improve on this, no doubt about it. Um, Democrat messaging on this has been, I guess, probably effective to some extent, given some of the numbers for the tax reform. But it's also a little bit over the top. Invoking today, Tiny Tim, let's watch. <laughs> what we're doing here today is basically saying, wealthy Americans, big fat Christmas present for you. Tiny Tim, we're taking your crutch away from you. And like Tiny Tim, Simon and his family now find their future in danger because of the greed of those with power, the cruelty that is in the heart of the tax scam. 
I thought it was the tiny Tim who tiptoed through the tulips, but I guess it's, oh, it's, don't, it's obviously the Christmas are, Carol ripping the crutch right. away from uh, only the uh, most from, cutting edge, most popular references from Democrats. Tiny Tim. Tiny Tim. I mean, are we talking about the 1930s one? What was that, Raymond? 38, 39, the, the original film? That was the great. I don't know who Tiny Tim is. I'll just put So, that so the little the millennial no doesn't even know who Tiny Tim is. That's all. Oh, there it is. There read he is. Your, read your dick in. He's stumbling. Okay. Look, you all see, right. it's Mitch McConnell took the crutch. Oh, no, he just hung it up. Oh. Uh, but that's so over the top. Look, we, the economic growth has been really strong. Obama did so not have two quarters of these types because we need to grow wages in the country and we need to repatriate capital, which I think is really important. If we don't bring capital back to the United States, that is not going to be good for the average man and woman. But uh, Molly, what what is the Repu what do the Republicans have to do? As I asked Pence to message this to people who are maybe hostile to the president's message, parts of the country that maybe don't like him very much, California, New York. I'd take this all over the country. Right. Be bold about it. Again, it makes sense that Democrats would be screaming and caterwauling about everything. But the, it, what's frustrating is how much of the media participated that in that as well. And usually when the general public is confused about the effects of legislation, you might see the media explain what's actually going to happen, like the vast majority of people are receiving tax cuts, or like how I found out with my husband that we're going to get a nice, uh, a nice decrease in our taxes. But so I think part of it is making sure that when people see higher paychecks, when they see lower taxes, reminding them who got them that and making sure that's consistent messaging. Um, the, the, there has there have been good things about the messaging, but something went awry where people got the wrong idea about this. All right. We have a lot more with both of our analysts here. So stay right there. Part two of my interview with Vice President Pence and this debate when we return. Now more of my exclusive interview earlier this evening with Vice President Mike Pence at the White House. We learned not to trust polls all that much back in the 2016 election, but much of the media just cannot stop obsessing about the president's relatively low popularity. So I asked the vice president if the tax reform triumph will lift the president's approval rating. Why do you think the president's numbers are where they are? Again, all polls, not just one, including Fox's poll. He's in, a, he's in the 30s. That's the lowest point of any president at this point in his first term. I'm not all about the polls, believe me. But all things considered, it's better to be popular than not. So going into this new year, midterm elections, the generic ballot, every poll shows Republicans down double digits. Right. What do what does the Trump Pence team need to do to tell this story to suburban women? to millennials, to African-Americans, to Hispanics. Are you going to go to those places, even hostile places that people don't like you very much, and sell that story? Well, first, let, let me say uh, one of the enduring lessons for me of uh, election 2016 was don't believe the polls. I, mean, I, don't, I don't remember a poll that had us anywhere close to winning, and uh, President Trump won a historic uh, victory. And uh, so we, we're skeptical about what the poll numbers are. Yeah, but you are. saw with the turnout but, in the Alabama let race. Let me take your point. I think, I think, if, the, out, I think if, the president was, if the president was sitting here, what he would say to you is, we're just going to keep delivering. Mm -hmm. They're going to keep talking. They're going to keep resisting. We're going to keep delivering. And, and as the American people see us with a stronger America at home and abroad, a safer America. I mean, think about the progress on the international stage in the last year alone. Our NATO allies are contributing as never before. North Korea's been isolated. We've put Iran on notice and pulled out and not certified the Iran nuclear deal. And, and the ISIS caliphate has collapsed. We've actually taken, the, the, in, in, in Raqqa, we've taken back what, they, what the, the capital of their so-called caliphate was thanks to the courage of our armed forces and the leadership of our commander in chief. We, we've made incredible Progress. That's why I asked the question about the polls. That is un an unbelievable record in one year. I th by any standard, if people are being objective, but the media, the, the, you know, the establishment media right. doesn't want to give a shred of credit to this administration. And many of them are actually crediting the Obama administration for the economy, believe it or not. So they're getting credit. So the getting those numbers up, I know you don't believe in the polls, but you don't think that's important in the midterms with these critical oh, Senate sure. races, given you got a lot of people want President Trump to resign. You got a building movement to investigate him on sexual harassment allegations in the Senate, in the House. Don't you guys need that House and Senate majority? Yeah. Well, let, let me let me be clear. I, I'm skeptical about what the poll numbers are, uh, but I, I think you can count on the fact this president, myself, our entire team, 
We're going to be canvassing across the country in the next year. We're going to be telling the story of the progress this country is making. But I, I really have to tell you, I mean, we live in a very divided time in the life of this nation. And I think the president and I truly believe that being in the most powerful economy in the world that only grew by 1.8% every year on average for the last eight years has created a level of frustration. When the president coined that phrase, the forgotten men and women of America, he tapped into a frustration the American people were feeling that they knew it could be better. They knew the economy could be stronger. They knew we could be standing again and commanding the respect of nations around the world. We just needed new leadership to do it. And I, and I truly do believe that as, as we go forward, uh, that, and we tell that story and the American people see those results, I think we're going to see some of this division in the country begin to wilt away as we see economic opportunities, wages begin to rise, our military standing tall and standing strong again. Have you been interviewed by the Mueller team? I have not. No. Yeah, they, they, this has been, a, an, a, I think, over the last month or so, it has been demonstrated that key members of this investigation are loyalists of either the Obama administration and or Hillary Clinton. Knowing what you know and probably what you've seen about some of these investigators who are still working in this office, do you have faith that this will be a fair and impartial uh, investigation going forward? Well, let me say we're fully cooperating with the special counsel and we'll continue to. But, but I, I have to tell you, um, it's just not been a focus of mine or of this president. I think the reason you saw us pass the largest tax cut in American history. I think the reason you've seen the progress of a stronger, more prosperous America at home and abroad is because whatever Washington, D.C. has been focused on, this president, myself, our entire administration have been focused on where the American people are focused. And so we'll, we'll, we'll let the special counsel do their job and continue you to cooperate. Are you surprised they took all those emails, but those transition gonna, emails? We're going to continue to focus on our job. And uh, I think that's exactly what the American people want us to do. But that, that, it does take up time because you have to do document uh, pr production. You have to, you have to you know, consult with counsel. I mean, a lot of people in the White House, they have to hire lawyers. And I mean, I remember working in the White House as a young 20-something in this building. And I mean, I didn't have to hire a lawyer, thank God, but that, might not, that must not be very fun. And a lot of Republicans think, this investigation is proceeding in an unfair manner because of the types of investigators that are on staff. And it continues to be a problem for a lot of people. I, I can just tell you and your viewers that we're just, we're just going to continue to cooperate. Christmas but they should know we're going to continue to stay right focused where they want. When I'm traveling around this country, I got to tell you, it, and this again, present company accepted. When you're traveling around the country, people are sticking their hand out, shaking their hand, saying, Thanks for what you're doing for the military. Tell the president thanks for what he's doing standing with law enforcement. Tell him thanks for what we're, what we're seeing in this economy once again. I mean, people are standing tall again. And on a day like today, when we see the Congress under President Trump's leadership pass the largest tax cut in American history, the biggest tax reform So much for the divided Republican Party. Years, they all came together. I, t I gotta tell you, it, I, it is, uh, it's humbling for me to be a part of it. And we're just getting started. Back now with the reaction, we're rejoined by Molly Hemingway and Igor Volsky. Uh, Molly, uh, the vice president, he's keeping, on, he's keeping on message and on focus that we're going to build on this legislative accomplishment. Mueller going to do what he's going to do, but we're going to keep our eye on the prize, which is the American people. Right. And it is, it is true that the generic ballot does not look good for Republicans and that there are midterm elections coming, coming very soon. What is the best way to handle it? Two things. One, the best defense is a good offense. It feels good to actually see some legislation get passed, I'm sure, and they should see they should build on that success. At the same time, I think that some of this is overwrought, some of these talks about polling and whatnot, because Democrats seem perhaps more divided than Republicans. They don't have a unified message. They're not sure whether they want to be hard left or whether they want to try and actually reach out to average American voters. So it's a long time until November. Igor. You know, the vice president said that progressives, Democrats, don't give Trump credit. Let me give him some credit. He has really broken the fever. So before Trump, people were like, Obamacare, ugh. Now people love Obamacare when he tried to repeal it. It was hard to get people excited about tax cuts. Now there are rallies all around the country opposing this bill. And as you pointed out, Laura, this tax bill, the approval ratings are in the toilet, are in the garbage. So 
And then, you know, you look at Virginia, you look at Alabama. If those two races are any indication, progressives, Americans are energized. And so I understand. I saw a guy on a bicycle today, by the way. He was he was riding like right past the White House at one of those like really big old fashioned bikes. And he had a big flag flying in the back. Resist. That was me. Well, oh, that was <laughs> Igor. That was me. Igor. Yeah. I thought That's it. why I thought I was booked. Kind of wind blown yeah. up today. Okay. Yeah, exactly. The resistance really is enthused. And the resistance isn't yeah, just the, the hard left. They're it's jacked. also the media. It's also never Trump establishment Republicans. But, and they really are excited. But the best way to fight against that is to actually give Republican voters something to you be enthused about. You need happy voters. And I don't think they, get, they had much to be enthused about heading into Virginia. Yeah, you need and happy voters. Alabama. And the Democrats are going to do what the Democrats are going to do. I mean, they got to, they got to rally behind something. And But the Republicans are unified. I've got to say, a lot of headlines of the last couple of years of how divided the Republican Party is. What I think you saw today in, in those comments at that rally at, Cap, uh, at, at the White House, these people who <laughs> never liked Trump are up there like, He's practically on Mount Rushmore for uh, Orrin Hatch and Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan and et cetera. But I think what happens sometimes with the Democrats is they go one step too far, which is what I think they did today over at the Huffington Post. Um, there was a, a writer named Andy Ostroy, Huffington Post contributor, and he tweeted about South Carolina Republican Senator Tim Scott being at the White House and standing prominently on stage next to the president. He said, what a shocker. There's one black person there. And sure enough, they have him standing right next to the mic like a manipulated prop. Way to go, Senator Tim Scott. And then Scott responded, uh, probably because I helped write the bill for the past year, have multiple provisions included, got multiple senators on board over the last week, and have worked on tax reform my entire time in Congress. Uh, but if you'd rather just see my skin color, please feel free. Uh, the Huffington Post contributor apologized on Twitter, which is nice. It's identity politics, though. You go right to... Okay, there's a black guy who happens not to be a liberal. Let's trash him. I found that to be lame. I've got to say, of all the things you want to complain about, it's the fact that Tim Scott's a Republican. Yeah, that's a really dumb tweet. It's a really dumb tweet, and I'm glad he apologized. But it's not just stuff like that. It's just the general hysteria. I mean, multiple times a week, you hear people say that everyone's going to die if uh, net neutrality is changed or if this tax bill gets passed. I mean, you cannot keep dying or telling people <laughs> that they're going to die and Grandma, nobody's dying. Grandma's eating Alpo because of, uh, you know, we're back at Paul Ryan's pushing the lady And not just the not dying, but keeping more of their money. Keeping more of their money is a good thing that a lot of people actually But, you know, like. let's not pretend like taking health care away from people, not giving people insurance, making it hard for if people to If by that you mean that the most unpopular part of Obamacare, it which is will result in death. No, the force, you have a situation, but mandate was a tax a on poor people, and that is a horrible tax. It's a freedom defying tax. And coverage. this is actually removed. Some percentage How many of them will die. Coverage? Some percentage of them will die. The people who have health care, the 20 million people who have health care under Obamacare, are happy they have it. It's why if you look at numbers about how satisfied are you with your Obamacare uh, coverage, those numbers are through the roof. Absolutely. Molly? No, it's just, I mean, I there's mean, a lot. The, truth, there, the fact is actually. Having health care insurance prior, is great. Prior to Obamacare, there were a lot of problems with health care. And, and the Republicans on the Hill did botch getting those fixed. There, Even though the individual mandate was taken care of, there's still a ton of regulations that need repeal to truly Alex fix Azar. the problems Alex Obamacare. Azar will be the new HHS secretary early in the new year year. And I say keep an eye on him. He was deputy HHS secretary in the Bush. He's no, he knows what he's doing. He's going to slash a lot of those regulations. My prediction. People will die. Uh, people will die. We'll people end will up, die, a, Laura. Merry people Christmas. People will die if they don't have People will die. Okay. People, will, people, Mostly people don't want it, the government to run their lives all the time either. But it's great to see both of you. Have a great holiday. On top of all this, good news for the administration. The script is suddenly flipping in the Russia probe when we come back. Fox News has learned that the FBI has not been able to corroborate any of the important allegations in that infamous, trashy Trump-Russia dossier. That was one of the major revelations from Deputy FBI Director Andrew McCabe during his seven and a half hours of questioning before the House Intel Committee yesterday. Congressional investigators tell Fox News there were several conflicts between his account and testimony from previous witnesses. Huh. And that means new subpoenas may be hanging on your Christmas tree. Oh, well, they're coming. Sarah Carter has been all over this investigation from the very beginning, and she joins us from sunny Phoenix. Sarah, oh, great yeah. to see you. How are you? I'm doing great, Laura. Thanks. Okay, so McCabe is going back tomorrow for the Judiciary Committee <laughs> testimony behind closed doors. But let's get to these conflicts uh, that the, uh, the questioners in Congress discern between what he said 
and what other witnesses have ever uh, already testified to. Well, I think this is what's most interesting, Laura, because McCabe, after seven hours, and I like the word interrogation because that's what I was told he went through. He went through an interrogation. He was trying to answer questions about the dossier, and although he was defending the dossier, when it came to having actual evidence of what was in the dossier, that he didn't have. The only thing he could corroborate was that Carter Page actually went to Moscow. Beyond that, everything else that was in that dossier they had no evidence of. Now, why is this important? I think you know, Laura, that this was probably used as the FISA. This was probably used to get those FISA warrants to continue to investigate members of the Trump campaign. And what now congressional members want to know is like, do, if you use this dossier for the FISA and you weren't able to corroborate anything in it, that's a big problem. And if other people are coming forward and your testimony is not matching those other people, we need to re-question them again. So we're going to need to send out more subpoenas. And I think that's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to call James Baker, the general counsel, who should be well aware of what's going on here. And they're going to call others. And I know they want to speak to Bruce Orr, who they, even have, they haven't even had a chance to really debrief yet on this. And Bruce Orr, everyone has to remember, his wife, Nellie. I like <laughs> Nellie. You haven't heard Nellie in a long time. I always think of Little House on the Prairie, but I like Nellie. It's a nice but name. <laughs> Nellie worked for Fusion GPS, uh, correct? Um, correct. She had a connection to the Fusion GPS, which, of course, paid for the dossier, worked with the Hillary campaign. And right. uh, Bruce Orr at the uh, FBI, did, was that disclosed when he was working on these cases? Was it disclosed when Fusion GPS became so important? Uh, we don't know that, correct? We don't know if Mueller, well, Mueller ever learned my... about it. He was removed, but... That's right. But according to the sources, he did not disclose that. And that's what's really fascinating here. Another thing that was apparently not disclosed was the fact that he had met with Christopher Steele and he had met with Glenn Simpson, the owner of Fusion GPS. And remember, Christopher Steele was the British former MI6 spy that they used to investigate uh, the Trump campaign. So this is what's really fascinating here. Why was Bruce Orr meeting with Christopher Steele before and then Glenn Simpson after? Why was he meeting them? And what was he discussing? And the fact that his wife was a part of Fusion GPS, that's a huge conflict of interest and that's a problem. Another problem, which an FBI agent brought up There's to me Nellie. tonight, was <laughs> Nellie, but was actually a Robert Mueller. And they were talking about Robert Mueller, you know, special counsel. And they were saying, look, if you look at McCabe, McCabe, now going back to Andy McCabe, his history, he was promoted all the way up to the number three when Mueller was still in charge of the FBI. So there's another potential conflict there. Uh, uh, and then uh, later... Uh, I want to I want to uh, ask you about Jim Rybicki. Is that how you say his name? Is the chief of staff uh, <laughs> of the F Rybicki, a, a chief of staff of the FBI. Reports are that he's going to be subpoenaed uh, to testify along again with Lisa Page, who, of course, is the paramour of uh, Peter Strzok. So both of them are are going to be returning uh, because we don't know if we don't know if Rybicki has already given any testimony. Correct. Yeah, that's correct. And, you know, we don't want to jump the gun here. Um, we only have bits and pieces of information. There's a lot of information that was done classified or behind closed doors that hasn't been released publicly yet. I know they're going to want to talk to Lisa Page. That's very important. And remember, she was having the affair with Peter Strzok the, um, with the FBI. Rubicki, I've heard many different things about Rubicki. I've also heard that he could easily be promoted to deputy director. So he may be ah, somebody to replace I Andy got it. McCabe. All right. Yeah. Well, the question is, why is and Andrew McCabe still in this position at all? It, but most, most everyone I know who has any credibility thinks he should have stepped down uh, quite a long time ago. Sarah Carter, it's great to see you. Have fun in the sun in Phoenix. Thank and you so I have, much, Laura. I have a question here, by the way. How far was President Obama willing to go to appease Iran and make a deal with him? And did he turn a blind eye to that very pleasant organization, Hezbollah? Uh, running drugs into the United States. You're not from Politico, says his administration forced the DEA to lay off a massive drug and weapon smuggling operation by the terror group, all in the name of securing the Iran nuclear deal. Now Obama foreign policy flax are coming out in force to try to discredit the story as a right-wing hit job by Politico. Joining me now to make sense of all this is John Bolton, Fox News contributor, former U.S. ambassador to the U.N. 
Politico right wing, that's a new one. Uh, yeah, that's a shocker. Answer. Look, if this story is even close to being true, it's dynamite. Uh, because it shows, yet again, the Obama administration would do anything to get this Iran deal. It was an act of appeasement. And the notion that you tone down a drug and money laundering investigation against the terrorist group Hezbollah for any reason uh, is just incredible. So they, they, the, the, the Obama spokespeople can say all they want. Let's have a congressional investigation about it. Wall Street Journal is calling for that tonight. Uh, I think that's great. Let's interview everybody. Let's get it all out there. I can't wait. It would be an official someone affirmatively going to the DEA and saying, ah, ah, hold, yeah, no, hold it, off on this. We, it, we don't want to complicate matters with this Iran deal. Right, exactly. Look, there are turf fights between law enforcement and intelligence all the time. I, I've seen them. I've been in them. That's not what this is. This is an effort to suppress this, invest, this, this uh, drug investigation so that the Iranian ayatollahs would not be upset. So the you, mullahs would be happy. You can understand that. Oh, of course. Of course. Now, Murray Harf came out. Uh, Tommy Veter came out and both said this is manufactured. We've never heard of this program. Let's move on though, to this vote tomorrow in the U.N. General Assembly on our decision to move our embassy to Jerusalem, which Obama, Clinton, Bush all said they were going to do, didn't do. Trump <laughs> actually does it. And now all hell breaks loose. Egypt, the Palestinian Authority, Hama, uh, Mahmoud Abbas said they're not going to meet with Pence when he visits the region. And Trump says, good, we'll save money. We're not going to give you any foreign aid. We're, you want to do that? We're cutting off your foreign aid. He said that today. I'm delighted by this vote. And just to preview it, I'll make my forecast. I think it'll be about 180 to 4 against us. So Wait, 180, 180. I, we'll, we'll vote to condemn Trump's decision to recognize the capital of uh, that Israel's many. being mm. Jerusalem. Yeah. Uh, so great. So uh, I think not only can we save some foreign aid, the time now to look at dealing with the forum in which these abuses take place. We had to veto a Security Council resolution earlier in the week. Uh, I think U.N. funding should be on the table. I think we should be looking at moving away from assessed contributions, taxation to voluntary contributions, withdrawing from some U.N. organizations. The only time they really pay attention to us is when money is at stake. So you'll see this interest in the Jerusalem capital issue disappearing when our contributions start drying up. John, you spend a lot of time, obviously, at the U.N. Think of that real estate, how much we could, you could turn that into a big disco. I mean, there's lots you can do. I mean, you could have a nice gym on the top floor. Co-ops. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a lot you can do. I mean, if Merkel has all this money over there in Germany, do open borders, bringing all these refugees and, and immigrants, they must have, they're rolling in dough in Germany. Why don't we move the whole thing over there? No, that's, you know, they want the U.N. system. I'm sure that uh, people just can't wait to move to Frankfurt or someplace. Yeah, I mean, you, they all get their parking tickets covered, all that, right? It's a good deal in the U.N. We're paying a lot of the tab still, right? Trump hasn't turned that around. We're 20, still 22%. That's the point. We pay 22% of most U.N. budgets. Let's make it voluntary. Nah. That's, that's a great point. Overall, rate the president's foreign policy this year, 1 to 10. Well, I think it's about an 8 overall. I think this Jerusalem thing was a 10 strike. And I think his central point on the tax cut, which is you need a strong economy to have a strong America in the world, something Obama never understood, never paid attention to. It's absolutely It's essential. peace through strength. And, it's and, exactly and Did right. Reagan in his first year announce a new national security strategy and then speak to it? I don't. No, this is, this is a new record. And, yeah. and that in and of itself, I think, says something. Uh, Ambassador Bolton. And have a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Great to see you. And while the media tries to save Obama's legacy, Hollywood is doing all it can to diss Trump. What a shock. We're going to tell you which movie star is proving once again no Trump insult is too petty and unfunny in just a moment. It seems like this is the wrong tax cut at the wrong time directed at the wrong people. It was a classic bait and switch. They dangled out there for the middle class, they're expecting a tax cut, and what it's really doing is helping the corporate special interests as well as the wealthiest in this nation. I'll ask you plainly, are you living in a fantasy world? Now we know they're popping champagne down Pennsylvania Avenue. There are only two places where America's popping champagne. The White House and the corporate boardrooms, including Trump Tower. Otherwise, Americans have a lot to regret. After all the president's promises, after all Republicans' brazenly, brazenly transparent mis misrepresentations to the American people, the true face of what Republicans stand for has been revealed. Well, it is a victory for billionaires like Donald Trump. It's a victory for wealthy campaign contributors like the Koch brothers. But this is a disaster for the American people. 
In response to the bill's critics, President Trump tweeted, quote, the tax cuts are so large and so meaningful, and yet the fake news is working overtime to follow the lead of their friends, the defeated Dems, and only demean. This is truly a case, he continues, where the results will speak for themselves starting very soon. Jobs, jobs, jobs. And joining us now with reaction is author and host of the Dana Show on Radio America, Dana Lash, America First Action spokesman and senior advisor, former Milwaukee County Sheriff David Clark, and incoming Heritage Foundation President Kay Cole James. All right, good evening. I, I, I have to tell you, and, and uh, I'll start with you, Dana. I mean, Armageddon, the yes. wrong bill at the wrong time. Are you living in a fantasy world? I mean, don't they totally lose their credibility? ability they do lose their credibility. Imagine they wanted to increase and keep high Americans' taxes for Christmas. Not a single Democrat was supporting this bill. You're not going to be able, they cannot lie to the American people when the American people see that they are keeping more of their money because these are going to kick in really quick. You, the, you can't lie to people about what's in their bank account. You can't lie to them about what's written on their checks. They're going to immediately start feeling relief, as we've seen from AT&T, as we've seen from Boeing. This is our money. And Corporations, and by the way, Chuck Schumer was attacking AT&T, claiming on in video that AT&T was going to use this to enrich in themselves. And what does AT&T do? They announce that they're investing in their employees and their community, as is Boeing and other companies, because this is how economics work. This is how math works. They're on the wrong side of the hist of, uh, of history on this. And I have to say, I think today so far has been the greatest day of President Trump's administration. This was a great day, a historic day. All right, and I'll go to you, David Clark. I mean, the whole idea that, that Dana leaves us with and is the repeal of the individual mandate in Obamacare. This whole thing is fantastic. Look, tax cuts drive Democrats and liberals crazy. They are the tax and spend uh, party, and they've been that for a long time. President Donald Trump knows that this economy, in order to get it kickstarted, needed fuel. That fuel was this tax reform and tax cut bill. There's been nothing but good signs out of this economy since he's taken office in January. Under Obama, we had nothing but stifling taxes, stifling job creation, loss of jobs, companies moving overseas. His policies had the effect of having its boot on the neck of the American company. Well, that boot has been taken off today with this historic uh, tax reform bill. And Kay, I'll go to you. I mean, you know, incoming president uh, to the Heritage Foundation. I mean, how, how do you view this passage? <laughs> Well, first of all, you know, it's an exciting Christmas for me coming to the Heritage Foundation and then the president and the speaker and the majority leader delivering a present like this for all Americans. You know, facts are stubborn things. And no matter what the Democrats say today, the reality is the American people are going to see those tax cuts in their wallets. They're going to see them in their paychecks. They're going to see it in the jobs that are being created. And no matter what they say, no matter how they try to demagogue this issue, the reality is Americans got a wonderful gift today. And, uh, you know, I don't think that uh, the champagne is being popped in <laughs> corporate boardrooms, but the reality is there are some American people sitting around their kitchen tables this evening that have a lot to be grateful for well, to this president and, and to this Congress. And, and Dana, clearly, I mean, this is a great time of year. So when I hear uh, the Democrats saying it's the wrong bill at the wrong time, I mean, first of all, this is the best time to oh. do it. That's just, just my take. Uh, on the holidays. But, but more than that, Dana, if they're really that angry about it, this continuing resolution that's coming up, you know, the, 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 the government shutdown on, on Friday, uh, I mean, they would, they would shut the government down. I mean, but they're not going to oppose this, are they? The continuing no, resolution. No, and, and they, they shouldn't be. They shouldn't. They, they shouldn't do, they shouldn't oppose this, and they shouldn't try to shut government down because they're having a tantrum over Americans getting to keep more of their own money. You know, according to Democrats, there's no good time to allow Americans to keep more of their own money. <laughs> and, and Judge Janine, I want to add as well, for, for individuals that are so upset that the government is allowing them to keep more of their own money, they, this is just the minimum. I want to remind people, they are free, we live in America, God bless the USA, they're free to pay more to the government if they so choose. They can 
write a check to the Treasury and they can pay more. They don't have to listen to the government's minimum suggestions in terms of tax brackets. They can pay 50 percent, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 percent of their income to the government. That's their choice. And but David, David Clark, what do you say to those who say that uh, it has a negative impact on the on the debt, that it's going to increase the debt? Well, you know, that stuff remains to be seen. But here's the here's the issue for uh, the president today. He has to get this economy going. He's already done that. But this thing is going to pick up steam. And if the Democrats don't get out of the way, they're going to get run over by this robust economy. Um, they're trying to throw a wet blanket over this historic occasion, but it's not going to work. The American people sent Donald Trump, like I said, the only person in Washington, D.C. who's actually created jobs has been Donald Trump. He understands what how, the, the role that the uh, uh, politics can play in either stifling the economy or giving it juice. So this is good. And as soon as this thing really takes off, I think it's a good night for the Democrats. <laughs> All right. And, you know, I'm going to ask uh, that, that you that we listen to some sound from Representative Jackie Spire uh, and, and then I'll go to you. This is the ultimate bad Christmas Carol story. <laughs> this may be the most shameful day in the history of Congress. Wealthy Americans, big fat Christmas present for you. Tiny Tim, we're taking your crutch away from you and all the other kids in this country and we're putting a lump of coal into your Christmas stocking. It's shameful, it should not be happening in this country of so much wealth and so much greatness that we would allow, allow these children and the 370,000 pregnant women in this country that also rely on CHIP, that we would shut them out of health care. Kay, this is the same Congresswoman who said last week that the president was going to fire Mueller, that when everybody went on vacation, he was going to do it. And she had it on, you know, a, a, a good uh, a, a reason that this is what was going to happen. She was clearly wrong. The president came out a minute later and said not. But, but Kay, what do you think? That is just absolutely shameful. I mean, to, to use Tiny Tim, come on now, and his crutch? The reality is the American people are not going to fall for that. Democrats have got to come up with something better than that. You know, we hold every, at the Heritage Foundation, we hold everybody's feet to the fire. Yes, Democrats you do. and Republicans. <laughs> we really, really do. And when, when Republicans are wrong, we'll call them on it. We're just getting started, by the way, on tax reform. There's much more that we can do. But going before the American people with Tiny Tim at Christmas, come on now. Well, you know what? <laughs> and uh, this is uh, the biggest tax reform, uh, certainly in 31 years. But I think it's all going to bode this, well for Americans. I want to thank you, Dana, David, really and Kay, for being with us tonight. And coming up, a breaking Fox News exclusive report. During his testimony yesterday, Deputy FBI Director Andrew McCabe had conflicted statements from other previous. Welcome back to Hannity. We are learning more about FBI Director Andrew McCabe's seven-hour appearance before the House Intelligence Committee last night on the ongoing Russia investigation. Congressional investigators are exclusively telling Fox News that McCabe's testimony contained numerous conflicts with statements made by previous witnesses. According to these sources, the big issue at hand is whether McCabe told the truth about the FBI's probe into the anti-Trump dossier and the exact time frame when he found out that it was funded by Hillary Clinton's campaign as well as the Democratic National Committee. Due to McCabe's alleged discrepancies, Republicans on the committee are planning to issue fresh subpoenas next week on Justice Department and FBI personnel. Joining us now with reaction, Republican Congre Congressman Raul Labrador. All right, good evening, Congressman. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, you know, this, this uh, uh, seven-hour testimony by McCabe uh, is, uh, seems to present a lot of uh, uh, paradoxes that, you know, apparently these guys don't have their stories together, which suggests to me as a judge that somebody's lying. 
No, we, we have a major problem. We have the Department of Justice that has an issue with the subpoenas that have been issued. They haven't answered all of our questions. But most importantly, you have an investigation that was started that it appears now for political reasons. The Democrats have been claiming that there was collusion between the Repu Republicans and, and the Russians. And what we're finding out is that there was a collusion, but the collusion was between the the Democrats, the Department of Justice, and the people who were doing this dossier. So we have a problem, and we need to get to the bottom of it. Well, I, I must tell you, Congressman, that I had uh, a couple of your uh, fellow congressmen on, on justice last Saturday night, and they said that they had gotten approval to start with the subpoenas as quickly as possible, given the resistance by the FBI as well as the Department of Justice. It must frustrate you as, some, as an elected congressman that, as for some reason, the FBI FBI thinks that they're above everyone when in fact they clearly are not. Well, we have the FBI director in, in our Judiciary Committee. Christopher and he, Ray. And he promised us that he was going to get to the bottom of this. We also had the, dep the, the chief deputy at the D Department of Justice. And I believe that they're going to get to the bottom of this. I think they're investigating, investigating it. You have the, the, an investigation going on uh, with, all these with all these different members of the, of the previous administration. Uh, but uh, as you know, it would be very difficult. If you were a prosecutor, it would be very difficult to trust what these people were doing if you knew that they had a bias against the, the person that they were prosecuting. But, but you know what, even beyond that, when you say, you know, that, that you know, Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein uh, and Christopher Ray, head of the FBI, promised they would get this stuff to you, well, they haven't gotten this stuff to you, have they? No, they haven't, and, so and they need to. So why do you have to. confidence in them? Well, I have confidence that we're going to get to the bottom of this. I, I have confidence that the American people will demand results. We need to know what really happened. We need to know why these investigations started. We need to know whether there was any kind of collusion yeah, between the department. To, Congressman, with all due respect, we need to know it, but we need to get answers. And, you know, for the last year, nothing has happened. And we got to start holding people in contempt. we got to start making sure that you guys are respected. You have oversight over the over we the do. FBI and the, do. and the DOJ, so just keep their feet to the fire. Congressman Labrador, thanks so much for being with us. We will. Thank you very All much. All right, thanks. And joining us now with more reaction, Florida Attorney General Pam Bondi and Fox News legal analyst Greg Jarrett. All right, I'm going to go to you, uh, Madam Attorney General. Uh, okay, you're a prosecutor. Uh, what do you do when people resist and don't want to give you evidence? Well, first of all, Janine, you and I, in careers basically in law enforcement, um, they have to give you the evidence that, that they need to give you. But more importantly, none of these people, if they're not telling the truth in the big picture, they can never be used as witnesses in any case ever in court again. That's exculpatory evidence that the FBI will always have to turn over if they're not honest. So. If it's found that they're not honest when, when all these congressional hearings are finished, they can't be employed at all by the Department of Justice, period. All right. None all right. of them. All right. But, but that, that relates to the Department of Justice. I'm talking about taking them out in cuffs and making sure that if people are right. perjuring themselves, if there is an effort on a conspiracy on the part of these, these higher ups in the FBI and DOJ uh, to create a you know, fake dossier, which they then get uh, you know, before a FISA judge and the judge issues a warrant. I mean, this is a, a fruit of the poisonous tree, Greg. One of the key questions was when did you find out that this dossier was phony this was posed to Andrew McKay we don't really know the answer but it's critical if they knew it was phony and they went to a federal judge uh, and used fake or dubious evidence in an affidavit to gain a warrant to spy on President Trump and his associates. That's a fraud on the court. It's a crime. But, That's a critical question. But, Greg, the fact that the FBI and the Department of Justice are refusing to give this information. Right. I listened to Rod Rosenstein. I listened to Christopher Ray, the FBI. They, they were punting. They wouldn't give an answer. They don't have that right. They do not run their own government. Peter King, a congressman who sat in yesterday, 
yesterday behind closed doors into the hearing said adequate answers were not given by Andrew McCabe. Now, you know what that means as a judge and and I do as a lawyer. That means somebody's lying and covering up. So it's triggered all of these other subpoenas that are going to happen in the course of the next several days to get other witnesses in. And Andrew McCabe, the man on the screen there, has a lot to answer for because he's a guy whose signature is on the documents saying that he was aware of the origins of the dossier, that is Hillary Clinton and the Democratic National That's Committee. Right. And yesterday, apparently, according to our source in the hearing, he said, oh, gee, you know, I don't really remember when I found out Hillary was behind well, this. And, and you know what? It's even worse, uh, uh, Pam, because then what what he does is he goes with his wife to try to get some right. money from Hillary, uh, from Tim McAuliffe, the governor of Virginia. I mean, that's a conflict right there. Can you explain to me why the taxpayers are paying this man's salary, why he continues to be deputy head of the FBI? Well, and, and he had a duty to reveal that, an affirmative duty. No one should have to come to him and say, do you have a conflict? He clearly had a conflict. So we have McCabe on the Clinton investigation to explain to your viewers how complicated this whole thing is. We have Strzok, who is now still, believe it or not, employed. What is he yeah. now down in HR, but should no longer be employed, <laughs> who changed the language um, <clears throat> regarding what Comey, Comey right. regarding Comey and Hillary Clinton and he and his text messages to his girlfriend Lisa Page employed show complete disdain for the commander in chief of the United States and they and should have never been involved yeah. in this investigation go ahead go never ahead. You know, what's interesting is Democrats in the mainstream media, and I realize that's redundant, keep saying, well, Mueller got rid of Peter Strzok. Well, yeah, but how much damage did Strzok do in the full year he was on the case? He's the guy who launched it in July of last year. And why did Comey? cover up the reasons behind getting rid of Peter Strzok for five long months, never telling Congress, yep. never telling the American people. That is deceptive and dishonest by Robert Mueller. Well, I'll tell you, there's more coming up on all this story. And I want to thank you, Pam Bondi and Greg, Attorney General Pam Bondi and Greg Jarrett. And coming up, President Trump is threatening to cut foreign aid to countries, the plan to evolution opposing any recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Capital. This comes after President Trump earlier this month boldly announced his intentions to move our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley is warning that the U.S. will be taking names. And today during a cabinet meeting, President Trump doubled down on Ambassador Haley's message. Take a look. I like the message that Nikki sent yesterday at the United Nations for all of these nations that take our money and then they vote against us at the Security Council or they vote against us potentially at the Assembly. They take hundreds of millions of dollars and even billions of dollars and then they vote against us. Well, we're watching those votes. Let them vote against us. We'll save a lot. We don't care. But this isn't like it used to be where they could vote against you and then you pay them hundreds of millions of dollars and nobody knows what they're doing. So, Nikki, that was the right message that you and I agreed to be sent yesterday. And I've had a lot of good comment on it, believe me. People are tired of the United States, the people that live here are great citizens that love this country. They're tired of this country being taken advantage of and we're not going to be taken advantage of any longer. And joining us now is Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, Danny Dannon. All right, uh, Danny, I, I, I love the idea of taking names. I love the idea of, you know, you're not going to do this to us anymore. But is it anyone's business where the United States decides to put its embassy in a foreign country? Good evening, Judge. The U.N. has no right to tell Israel where the capital of Israel should be. And the U.N. has no right to tell the U.S. where to put the embassy of the U.S. in Israel. It says the audacity of the U.N. must stop. And I think tomorrow we will see another session of bashing, not only of Israel, bashing of the U.S. And no resolution that will pass can change the reality that Jerusalem is, as always will be, the capital of the state of Israel. You cannot change that. You know, so many presidents have promised that they were going to do it. What is it about this president that, I mean, obviously he's, 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 he's much stronger. 
But but why would they promise it and and not deliver? What was the harm to them? Were they afraid of these other countries? We see a different kind of leadership, and we appreciate that. It was a courageous, bold decision of President Trump. And not only that, also the veto of Ambassador Haley in the Security Council. Last year, I was in the Security Council, last December, and there was another resolution, and the previous administration supported that shameful resolution. We see the change. We appreciate it. This is the way to handle the U.N., to come with your values, with your ideology, and to change the U.N. We need to reform the U.N. And, and clearly the president is going to do that. He talked about it with NATO, and now he's talking about it with the U.N. And, but what, what money, uh, I mean, to, are there, is there money to individual countries that can be impacted by, you know, the United States saying, you don't vote with us, we're not going to give you money anymore? Well, that's for the president and ambassador heavy to decide about that, but there's a lot of hypocrisy in the U.N. And if you give money to those countries, I think you should demand from them. That's what we do when we support countries. I called many ambassadors today, and I told them, we support you. We share technology, cybersecurity, defense. So now we need you tomorrow at the vote. If you do not support us, we will also take notes. Why? I mean, even the United Kingdom, I mean, you know, they're, they're always supposed to be considered an ally. Why do they feel that they should have a say as to where Israel has its capital or the United States puts its uh, embassy? They think that they support the peace process, but it's exactly the opposite. They don't support the peace process. They support the Palestinian ideology of incitement, of running away from a dialogue. The only way to move forward is to have direct negotiations between the Israeli and the Palestinians. And the president's decision is the right move, because now that Palestinians understand that there is a new leadership, they have to decide whether they're joining the negotiations or we are moving on without them. And so, I mean, by, by, uh, by, by saying that, you know, this is going to disrupt the peace process, that's just their excuse. In fact, it hasn't gone forward for a long time. Maybe this is the way to do it. Look what happened in the last 20 years. So many emissaries, so many uh, summits. Nothing happened. I think this is the right approach, and I think the president will be engaged with the peace process. I think so. Anyway, thank you so much, thank Danny Gannon. Coming up, more Hannity right after the